lot. I am going to talk mostly about uh, Asia and then about Europe. Since I'm going to disagree with John quite a bit, I decided to come here because he's bigger than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I'm going to start with the less controversial part, but maybe at the beginning, and then we can continue. If you see, so what we have there is our growth forecast for 2011, 12, and 13. Well, and 13. What you can see is the global economy, according to our forecast, is going to slow down modestly in 2012 relative to 2011. And you see it's mostly a slowdown of the emerging market economies, right? The, the G10 economies actually, according to our calculations, are going to remain flat, whereas the emerging markets economies are going to move from 6.3 to 5.5. Obviously, there's a lot of volatility around this point estimate, but the bottom line is that what we are seeing at Barclays uh, is a, a reduction in the growth in emerging market economies. Now, within G10 economies, you can actually perceive uh, three major movements, right? On the one hand, the US recovering a little bit faster, okay, stronger, perfect. perfect. Uh, Japan actually having come from a very weak 2011 because of the earthquake, recovering, and Europe actually going a different way. So we had, that's, that's in G10. So on average, the same, but a very different contribution uh, of, of each country. In the case of, of emerging market economies, what we have is almost every region slowing down in a significant way uh, in 2012. Let me start with China, which is a, a, a country that is super important for driving economic growth globally. What we are seeing there is growth slowing down from 9.1 to 8.1% in 2012. So it's a significant slowdown. It's what the Chinese would call a, sl uh, a soft landing, not around 8%, but it's, a sl it's still a soft landing. No, it's not a hard landing. Hard landing is to 6% in China. So a soft landing, what is in, a, in what I would say most people see a few risks in, in China. One, there is a property bubble right, that is, has started to be deflated. I think it's something to watch out. Many people s normally see property, the deflation of property bubbles, right, uh, the bursting of the bubbles as a precondition for, for a bigger crisis, sometimes financial crisis. So you have seen for a third month in a row, you can see how uh, housing prices are coming down significantly in China. Second, you start to see some small or medium-sized enterprises actually that are uh, that are, uh, you have in some bankruptcies that are important. There is a shadow banking system in China also, as a, as a result of the, of the really very constrained banking system and the re regulated, there's a shadow banking that is, has been increasing and there's some concerns about that as well. And obviously you have the effect of Europe in terms of exports in, in China. So these are the, the, the concerns people have about China, also some, the, 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 the solvency of certain local governments or municipalities, as you may remember in, in, in post the crisis in, in 2008, 2009, there was a huge amount of investment funded by the local governments, and some of them don't really have the money to pay it back. Now, somebody once said about China, the pessimists are more scholarly but the optimists are normally right. And what does that mean? Like we, if we, China is a very different country. So I'm not, under a normal paradigm, we would really be very pessimistic about the bursting of the housing bubble. But China has certain things that I believe rationally can, can explain why this, China is probably going to engineer a soft landing as opposed to a, a very dramatic hard landing. Um, what are those? First, the bursting is of, the, of the housing bubble actually is in a way policy induced. So what we are not seeing in China is a very dramatic slowdown of, uh, of the economy because of you know, like, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the domestic dynamics. What we are seeing is that policy makers are trying to deflate the housing bubble and that that means that if things actually get a, can get a little bit more difficult, they can actually take out of the restrictive monetary policy. Second, we haven't seen any systematic uh, 
risk in, 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 in uh, developing China uh, uh, yet. And third, and I would say most important, the quality of the balance sheet is very, very different from what we have seen in the US, in the UK, in Spain, etc. For example, um, household debt in China, the stock of household debt in China is less than the flow of household savings in one year in China. So it's a, we're talking about stock versus the flow, right? So first thing is that house, households are actually have a very strong balance sheet contrary to, to other cases, right? Second, the banking system NPLs are 2%, which, has, which are actually very, very low, and 21% reserve requirements. So that's super highly, uh, uh, they have strong uh, cash in there in case of any problem. And third, the, bank, the, the government actually has only 17% of a debt to GDP ratio, right? And in a debt dynamics that John was showing, if you have an economy that's growing 8%, you liquefy every debt, basically. You can sustain very high debt, and at 17%, I guess you can sustain any level of, uh, you know, like even a ne very negative primary surplus would, would uh, be able to work. Even if you include a lot of contingent debt, assuming that some banks uh, fail, assuming that you have to bail out certain municipalities, local governments, still, the worst case scenario is a 70% um, debt to GDP ratio in, in the worst, worst case scenario. But the balance sheet in China is, at the end of the day, a very strong one that allows you to, 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 to weather a potential storm. And most importantly, this is not a market economy, right? A real market economy. The, what happens when you have a property bubble normally is that the bank's balance sheets are hit, right? A bank's they have to contract credit, there's a credit crunch, the economy actually slows down, and then you have this vicious circle, self-fulfilling, self-reinforcing, uh, where banks create, the credit con uh, tightening of the banks actually worsens the value of the assets, which then worsens the balance sheets of the, of the, of the banks, right? This sort of uh, uh, self-fulfilling negative dynamics is unlikely to happen in the, in the, in China because the banks actually lend according, not according to market rules, but they are induced to learn. There's a lot of moral suasion, they're uh, public sector owned, right? So the lending is, is actually uh, determined basically by decree as opposed to determined by normal market conditions. So I would say that in the most likely scenario, we're gonna see a slowdown in China, front loaded, so, but unless Europe collapses, and collapses meaning like a really an event, right? Not, not the slowdown of uh, as a result of that great uh, tightening, but the real event in, in, in Europe. Unless that happens, China is not gonna be a source of, uh, of, uh, of, um, you know, um, of, you know, like of, of additional concerns in, in, the, in the global economy. It's not, it's unlikely to save the world either, right? Remember in, in, in 2008, 2009, the significant fiscal tightening, the fiscal, uh, you know, like easing that you saw, fiscal and monetary easing you had in China really saved the world. The countries that actually were able to do came back earlier were the ones that actually um, were closer geographically, like in emerging, emerging Asia and Japan, or uh, economically, like the American commodity producers who actually got the benefits of, of the, in the economic integration with China. So let's move on to the U.S. I don't want to, you know, given that we have, we don't, I plan to respect my time. Uh, we don't have, um, we don't have a lot of, uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the U.S. I don't have a comparative advantage. The one thing that I wanted to tell uh, to John is that I think with respect to this Occam's law, there may be some changes in the demographics because you have not had growth above 2.7% over the last 2.5, 2.7, right? Over the last, whatever, three, four years. And you have seen over the last year and a half a reduction of 1.5 percentage points of unemployment rate. So I think what some US economists are claiming that the demographic forces that are so important in many countries also are playing a role in terms of, of you need much lower growth now to see much uh, a reduction in employment rate in the US. You know, you have seen it from 10.1 to 8.6 with growth below two and a half uh, at every point in time. Now, moving to Europe, where I feel more, I feel stronger about. I, and I'm not European, I'm Peruvian, so I'm not Italian despite the name. Uh, and uh, so I, that's not the source of a passion. I, I think 
I, I, I spent actually a lot of my time, as you can see in my CV, uh, talking about, and I had written something, but I'm not gonna use. Uh, I spent a lot of my time looking at emerging markets, right? And emerging markets, we had what was called the original scene, right? What was the problem with emerging markets? You had dollar debt, and your central bank only issued pesos, right? So that means that you countries were unable, like 10 years ago, to issue debt that that, can, that that central bank could issue, right? So you were forced to borrow in dollar denominated debt. That was the problem of Brazil, Mexico, Asian currencies as well, right? Nobody would lend the Mexican government for 30 years peso denominated paper. Nobody would lend the Brazilian government 30 years peso denominated paper. So since the Brazilian government wanted to borrow for 30 years, they had to borrow in dollars. So that's so that was some uh, Ricardo Hausmann from 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 a uh, from uh, Harvard called that the original scene. So you were born that way, and uh, and you could not issue you cannot issue in, in, in your own currency. Somewhere, somewhat over the last years, emerging markets redeemed themselves. Right, got got somewhat baptized. It. I don't know what happened, but they started to borrow in local currency. Right. So you now have what a 40-year Mexican paper. You have Brazilian paper, very long term, etc. And Somewhat, I think there's a very clear parallel of what happens between Europe and what happened in emerging markets in the past, right? If you really go to the numbers that John showed, right, you really cannot explain why the UK trades at two and a half percent, two and a quarter percent, and Spain trades at, at now at five percent, right? You cannot really explain why Italy trades at six percent today. And, 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 and Japan trades at 1%. Japan's debt to GDP ratio is a lot higher than Italy. So it's, it cannot be the debt to GDP ratio, right? The, Japan's debt to GDP ratio is net like 200, whatever, gross 120, Italy's 100, right? Japan has a minus 8% primary deficit. Uh, Italy has a positive, this year is gonna have a positive primary deficit, right? The average interest rate in Italy at the market, the marginal is six. But the average marginal interest rate in Italy is 4%. So the coupon, the average coupon, so you don't pay what the market is asking you to charge. If you don't borrow or borrow, borrow little, what you really pay is the average coupon on your, on your debt. Italy has a debt duration of seven years, right? So it will take on average 14 years to replace all the debt. So from 4% moving to 6 or 7%, right now markets are, are 6%, it will take you a lot of time to increase your, 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 your average interest rate to a much higher rate. So there's no way around it. The Japan's debt dynamics are a lot worse than Italian debt dynamics. I mean, it's interest rates, growth rate, debt to GDP. To put it differently, uh, Italy needs like a 2%, 1.5% to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio, according to the IMF. And Japan needs like around 12% of primary balance adjustment to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. So it cannot really be that debt dynamics and, and uh, that, 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 that are the difference between uh, Japan and, 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 and Italy. What is the, what's the difference? It can be partly the fact that Japan is a, a currency, a reserve currency, right? Uh, the fact that it has a very large domestic investor base that are buyers of. Uh, of, uh, of Japanese debt, but the truth is that Italy was known as having a very strong investor base as well. Like in Japan, it's 95% of the, of, uh, of the investor base is domestic. In Italy, it was 60%, right? But it's a lot higher in the US, so Italy had a strong investor base. What's the problem? The problem is that Italy is in the Eurozone. So it's in this gray area of countries that if investors get negative, actually can, uh, enter into self-fulfilling negative dynamics, right? But it, and Greece is an obviously insolvent and bankrupted country. Portugal and Ireland, we could we could uh, we could uh, argue about it. But Italy or Spain, I mean, I have really done. I have played in MATLAB. I have run all the numbers for this country. So it's a. They are not. They are not. They are certainly not bankrupted countries. They are countries that actually are in this way, a gray area that if nothing happens, the market moves you to the bad equilibrium, right? There's a good equilibrium of 4%, 5% yields where these things, these countries should be able to make it. And there is this very bad equilibrium of default. The problem is that once you enter into that net, in the self-fulfilling market dynamics, it's very difficult to break them, right? Why? 
Because if I am an investor and I suddenly become concerned about the possibility of default and the cost of Italian debt is, let's say, uh, right now is a price of 85, things go right, prices go to 90, 92. Things go wrong, prices go to 40, recovery values. So I'm in the middle. I say, well, if I don't know what's going to happen, right, I charge 70. And at 70, the yields of Italian debt become 25% and the country gets bankrupted. So, so that's the problem why once you are in these negative dynamics where the market is nervous, buyers disappear. Because even at 7% yields, which are too high for the country in the long term, there are no buyers, right? Why has this been broken over the last days, right? I don't think has been the, mesh, the measures uh, uh, applied by Monty. I think has been a perception. I think there have been two things at least. First, the fact that the investors were very short, and so short covering has taken care of part of that. Has been part of one of the reasons. And the second one is because I think, and many people don't want to see this, but I think for the first time there's some roadmap, and I have. Because of my EM experience, I have been super pessimistic and cynical, about, like most EM investors, about Europe. Because we have seen it before. It has always played up, pay up, paid up to be very negative on Europe over the last two years, right? Uh, we have seen defaults, currency crisis, bank crisis, etc. And I think, like, you have in Europe two alternative scenarios, right? I don't think it's only one. I think there are two alternative scenarios. One of break of the euro, of the euro and a number of defaults, which I understand is John's uh, scenario. That's totally possible. I think Greece obviously already announced they will default, so that's not a question mark. The question is whether Portugal, Ireland, or maybe Italy, Spain, or more default. I would say that if Italy and Spain default, there's no reason why not uh, France, right, or Belgium, etc. This is not, it's, you know, like, there's not a statistically significant difference between France and Italy, to put it in, 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 in terms of, of the dynamics. It's not. It's much more, Greece is in a different camp, but I would say that among the others, it's a continuum, right? And, and you can, they're within this gray area that if investors think you are doomed, you are doomed, and investors think you are not, you are doing well. So, um, what I was saying, I forgot. <laughs> I might not, so it's, huh? About, right, so the, the good scenario, that's, that's a bad scenario, no? Of breakup, right? <laughs> the other scenario, is a one that actually the, f the Germans have decided to implement, which may or may not work. I think the Germans want to move closer to a fiscal union. So I think for the first time in this crisis, I think there's something that may make sense. I'm not saying that it will work necessarily, but for the first time in this crisis, there's something that may make sense. What are the components of this potential uh, roadmap? I think like in, First, you need, obviously, a combo of fiscal adjustment and, and, um, and growth-enhancing uh, measures, right? I think you are seeing the austerity part. You haven't seen yet the growth-enhancing measures, right? Because at the end of the day, the debt dynamics really depend not only on how much you can adjust your primary balance, but on the growth part. And I think the growth part. And I think that's you have ar already started to see. In a way, this. The, the austerity measures, I think, are important for two reasons. On their own, they matter to improve the debt dynamics. But I think also, and that's a second uh, issue to mention, because that gives a reason for the ECB to intervene, right? Because if the ECB were to act as lender of last resort, right, if the ECB were to decide to short circuit the market dynamics, the problem actually can actually be eliminated or at least reduced in a very significant way. Because if the ECB acts that way, Europe as a whole, or it can become not too different from the UK or Japan or, or the Fed. At the end of the day, the advantage that Japan, the UK, and, 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 and the US have is that their central bank can actually always print money. So it's almost impossible to default. You can generate inflation. But it's very difficult to default because in the, in the bad scenario, actually, they, an investor know that the, the, the Fed is going to print money, the Bank of Japan is going to print money, and, uh, and the Bank of England is going to print money. That means that your range of outcomes is not 40, right? So if things go wrong, actually, there is inflation, but inflation you know, gets 
you, you get hit one or two percent per year for many years, right? So, and I would say that if the bank, if the ECB actually starts to act as a lender of last resort and is willing to print money, you short circuit to a large extent the problem. But the ECB doesn't want to do this big bazooka that some people are calling. I don't think it's necessary, right? Big bazooka meaning, right? I mean, you print and you say, I'm going to buy unlimited amounts of Italian debt at what at 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 five percent deals of five or or percent or lower right that that is not going to happen but but Draghi was very clear last week right when he said I need a fiscal compact once he, there is a fiscal compact I think you are uh, uh, they, they they have a, so if you have a fiscal austerity program and you have uh, the other components of the program I think like that gives the ECB an excuse to. To, to start uh, intervening because I think they, they want to avoid a default because we really do not know what happens in an Italian default. I don't think any, well, the only thing we know is that we don't know, right? I mean, in terms of where do you end? Because if Italy defaults, again, as I said, why not France? And then what happens to the banks? I mean, Lehman is gonna be a joke, right? So the idea that you can manage a default in a country of the size of Italy, Spain, right? Banco Santander is the largest European bank, right? With, I mean, they, 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 they are just extremely dominant, right? So it's a, it's a situation that is very difficult to, 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 to let go. That doesn't mean, I think the market, uh, yeah, one minute. <laughs> uh, no, 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 okay, I'll finish, I'll finish. Okay, so, yeah, I, I think we can, we'll have some debate later, no, I assume. <laughs> okay, uh, let me stop here, and then we have Q&A, okay? Thanks.